going to be maybe not a theme of my message today, but that's kind of the theme of the day. As I said, as we get after the service, there are opportunities to, to step forward and acknowledge that, you know what, we may not do it perfectly the first time, but we're called to, 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 to play our part. So again, thanks to Troy for stepping up and, and uh, helping. So we're going to turn now to First Chronicles chapter 13. And my title today is the death or death and the dance, David, Uzzah, and the Ark. Picking it up, starting in verse one again. The passage is up on the screen, and uh, otherwise, follow. Feel free to follow along in the Bible. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel. If it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands, to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So David assembled all of Israel from the Shehor River in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. David and all Israel went to Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God of, the, of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by the name. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart, with Uzzah and Ahiho guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God, with songs and with harps, lyres, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kedon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, because the oxen had stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah, and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died there before God. David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, How can I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. Now, growing up in the west side of Michigan, uh, I was very familiar with Lake Michigan. I spent a good chunk of my childhood going out there to the lake. It's beautiful. If you haven't been there, I strongly recommend that you uh, carve out some vacation time to get to the shores of, of Lake Michigan, especially on that eastern side. It's, it is gorgeous. People travel from all over the world to see this lake and the beaches. I've been to Florida. The beaches aren't any better there than they are on Lake Michigan. But there's another side of the lake that's often overlooked. The power of the lake. Now, one of the things that I loved to do as a kid was to walk out on one of the many piers, and you would stretch sometimes two, three hundred yards out into the water. And at the end of the pier would be a beautiful lighthouse. People would flock to that setting. Understandably, a tremendous view, a view that you don't often get unless you're on a boat. But I was always very cautious when I went out there, understanding and acknowledging that at a moment's time, circumstances could change for the negative. Now, these lakes out here, I love, but they're not the same. They don't give you any understanding of what you're dealing with at Lake Michigan. One wave hits you there, 
and you could be swept away. In fact, many times, every year, people walk the piers, and they may be in the, at the end of the pier, not even right at the edge, and a wave hits, and they're gone, never to be seen again. People just don't grasp it. It happens year after year, and yet it just continues to cycle through. Because they look at it as just simply another body of water. It is no different than anything they've experienced before. Now, I've never had the experience of that wave on a pier there, but I had that experience when I was by the ocean. And, and if you've never experienced the crashing of a wave... I remember I, I sat down foolishly, this was a foolish, I sat down to take, have someone take a picture when we were in North Carolina. And, and we, the waves were crashing in. It was, I thought, this is going to be a beautiful picture. Let's wait until the wave is cresting over us in the background. And sure enough, we got a pretty good picture. The camera person was standing probably 15, 20 feet in front of us, and the wave hit us, and I kid you not, I ended up with my legs and arms wrapped around the person taking the picture. And I think, what if the wave had gone the other direction? So why am I sharing this story? Well, I think part of it is that as we're walking out, as people walk out in the pier, they see the beauty, they see the good. It seems like a good idea. In fact, I recommend that when you go out there, walk the pier. Those are, it's a great great viewpoint. But don't forget about the power of the water. Don't lose sight of the beauty that you see and not acknowledge that there is this powerful force with which it does matter and it's vital. So in our text this morning, on the surface, if you just Skim over that. How many of you are familiar with this story? So they're traveling. They're going to take the ark back to Jerusalem. So on the surface, when we just read that passage, it appears that Uzzah is doing a good thing. And yet God deals with him with swift vengeance. We may focus, as Uzzah did, on the good. He wanted to move the ark. That was good. He wanted to move it to its intended destination. Interestingly enough, at the same time, what do we find David doing? He's dancing and celebrating. <clears throat> so he's along for the ride, but God didn't deal in the same way in this instance. So what's going on here? Why does it from the surface appear as though one guy is the, gets, takes the fall and the other one is seemingly let off the hook? Now it's easy to look at this story maybe, and especially if, if, if for people that like to scoff at scripture, say, how could you serve a God like that? He's just trying to save it and keep it off the ground. But I, as I read this text and reread it, it was a reminder to me as a believer, it is vital that we have work to be done. When a scoffer comes presenting something, it's time for us to do some work. If we don't know, well, you know, that's a good question. So now is the time to do the work and figure what's going on here. Why did God respond the way that he did so that we can better, because we will learn something more about who God is from this story. So my sermon is, in a sentence this week is this. God is holy, not to be trifled with. We wisely enter his presence with the awareness that he is a consuming fire. Now, how popular do you think that teaching is nowadays? Now, just a little history about the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured about 20 years previously by the Philistines. 
It was prior to David becoming king. The Ark of the Covenant was the national treasure, and it was the most sacred object. Because, as we acknowledge from earlier in the scripture, it was where the presence of God was held. It was kept in the tabernacle, in the most holy place. Things we've talked about again earlier this year. It was curtained off so that only the high priest could enter one day of the year, that day of atonement. But the Philistines captured the ark. And if you remember what happened, they took it, and then before long they returned it. Because they realized that it, was, it held the true God. It had overcome their idol of a God, and the people were sick and stricken with tumors. So here we find in our story that at the beginning, the ark is with Abinadab, 20 miles or so west of Jerusalem. Now when David established the throne in Jerusalem, he decided now is the time to bring the holy ark back to where the kingdom is centered at. He wanted it to provide the focus for the worship and as a rallying point for the nation. He wanted the glory of it back in Jerusalem. This was an important task. It was a holy task. The day that he does bring the ark back, later on he does bring it back to Jerusalem, was the greatest day of his life. Now, in the text that we read there, notice that the ark was carried on an ox cart. They had put it up on a cart, and then we noticed, acknowledged it says the oxen stumbled. And the ark was about to fall. So the ark is tipping off the cart, and he, Uzzah, kind of spur of the moment, does what probably most of us would do. We see something falling, we drop what we're doing, and we try to save it. Uzzah was one of the priests. Remember back in the beginning, early on, that when God gave them the law, one of the things was that it was the priest's responsibility to transfer the ark. Verse 7 said, The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And he struck him down. Now, we might have expected God to thank him for bringing the ark, you know, being part of the journey of bringing the ark back. So what gives here? What's going on in this story? David immediately, before we get to the answer to that question, David immediately has something, you know, runs through my, okay, I've got to stop here. You know what? This happened. We're going to call the mission off. It's clearly not something that we are to be doing today. In fact, which of us among us would continue a task if something like this happened in our presence? But three months later, he did complete the task. So what again is going on? Because we read that David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. He was accompanied by shouts and the sounds of trumpets. This transfer of the ark, what we see, is that it was an occasion, as I said in my title, for death and for dance. But now let's get to the crux of what everybody's probably focused on here. What was Uzzah's sin? What did he do here, or what, what was it that cost his life? Now, it might be tempting to say he just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. But we're told he was slain for irreverence in verse 6. Now, many of the Hebrew people treated the ark, at that point they were treating the ark as though it was a good luck object. It was like, well, if we have it, it's going to bring us luck, and if we don't, then bad luck. Now, one time a chaplain shared with me this story about how he had been treated similarly. He was a chaplain for the military, and so he was on, an, on a, uh, a helicopter, and he said that as troops would get on board when he was on there, they would often say to him, 
Oh, good. The chaplain's with us. We'll be safe. This chaplain, with an interesting sense of humor, responded, How do you know that this isn't God's day to take you home? Now, Uzzah saw himself as being responsible to take care of God. He had God in a box. And he assumed that it was his responsibility for keeping him safe from the mud and dust of the world. But in this, he ignored and maybe even defied, was it ignorance? Maybe. Was it defiance? Could be. Moses' clear direction on how to properly handle the ark. It was not to be touched with human hands, but carried by a pole inserted through the rings. Only the poles could be touched. R.C. Sproul once said this about this story. He said, Uzzah assumed that his hand was less polluted than the earth, but it wasn't the ground that would desecrate the ark. It was the touch of man. As I've already said, Uzzah was from the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite. He had been consecrated, presumably trained in exactly what he needed to do to transfer the ark. He knew the logistics of how to handle the moving and to where it needed to be placed in the tabernacle. The book of Numbers, a book that we often don't go to, or when we are in that book, we tend to just kind of gloss over it, or eyes glaze over. But there's, it's God's word, and what does he say? He clearly warned them that they may not touch the holy objects, or they will die. In fact, it goes even further. It says, they were not even to look at the ark. And so, they cover it up. It's to be covered with garments. Now, in Bosnia, anybody ever been to Bosnia here? There are a a bunch of landmines that are still in the ground, still buried. And they're still active. They've not been cleared. Most of them have been since marked with signs telling people, don't go there. You know, this is an unsafe place. So there was a story a while back that one night people were sleeping and all of a sudden they were awoke to a loud explosion. And they discovered as they went to check it out that an animal apparently stepped into one of the mines unable to heed the warnings. And it died. In the Mosaic Law, again, the part that we often want to just kind of shove aside, It's clear that there were clear warnings about how to handle the ark. But they foolishly disregarded them. He substituted what might have been regarded as more efficient innovation. I can picture Uzzah saying, you know, we could use these poles, or what about this fancy cart over here? You could stick it on a cart and push it along. He had greater technology, but his method was impersonal. He replaced the consecrated persons with a machine. The cart was new. They figured this must be an appropriate method to use. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm the first one to tell you I'm not opposed to technology. Obviously, I use technology. I wrote my sermon with technology. This isn't an (laughs) anti-technology sermon. But it's an understanding here that he was treating God, Uzzah was treating God as an impersonal force. He discovered that he was not in charge of God. It was contrary to God's law and was offensive to God. Now you still may be saying, this is incredibly unfair. He's going to die over this? How does that make any sense? 
But I think there's a point that we need to understand here that often gets overlooked. And this is, there may be no more pertinent doctrine or message that we need to hear in this time, in this age that we live in, that's raised in this. And it is this key attribute of God, his holiness. And as I said at the beginning, God is holy. He is not to be trifled with. And that we wisely enter his presence with an awareness that he is a consuming fire. We are not to utter his name loosely or lightly or in a profane manner. Now, what's interesting is, again, go back to when the Philistines had it for a second. We're told in the text in 1 Samuel chapter 6, you have to flip back a ways, 1 Samuel chapter 6, they gawked at it, they're staring at it, looking around at it. And, uh, I'm sorry, but after, after the, when the Israelites got it, excuse me, they, they were gawking at it, and what happened? Seventy people were slain by God at that site. That should have been a warning to Uzzah. Don't take God's commands lightly. This incident that happened was no accident. It was a sign from God. It's his way of halting the procession. He wasn't objecting the relocation. In fact, I just read a few minutes ago, three months later, they did relocate it. But he was opposed to how it was transported. The Pharisees, or the, sorry, the, the Philistines had used the same method, and they hadn't been any, seen any, uh, any downside or any effects. Nobody was killed there, but it was overlooked because they didn't have or know God's law. Thankfully, for their sake, for the Philistines' sake, they were able to guide the ark back to the Israel-like people. But the Jewish people, on the other hand, they had full knowledge of what God had spoken. They understood what it meant to treat something that was sacred. But they ignored it. I think the primary lesson here is that we, each of us today, have access to the one, true, mighty, holy God. We know him, but we are not to have casual familiarity with him. We are not to take him lightly and treat him as though he is a lucky charm. Or that he is just someone that we only go to out of desperation. We are to treat him with reverence and respect. Brothers and sisters, people all over the place are casually regarding the things that are sacred. We dismiss them left and right as though there's nothing sacred going on. Everything that we see is what is. Maybe you came here this morning, I hope that you didn't, but maybe you came here this morning to be entertained. If you haven't learned that from me already, I'm not here to be entertained. That's not my calling, that's not my responsibility, nor am I good at it. Maybe you've found yourself saying in the past, I've heard it from my kids, so I guess I have to blame myself for this, but... You say, well, church is boring. Maybe you've heard your kids say that. But you know what? I've never once heard someone who is in awe of God tell me that it's boring. Because they're here to worship the one true God. They're not, you're not here to listen just to me. You're here to listen to the Spirit speaking through me. You're here to, to glorify God. Uzzah thought he was doing the ark a favor by protecting it. Sometimes we even may feel that way when, when someone comes to you and says, well, what do, you, what do you say about this, about God? And so you, maybe you put up your, your hands, how do, I, how do I defend God's honor in this? How do I defend his reputation? But you don't defend a lion. You just get out of the way. 
David became upset at God. He became angry at God, distressed, or even, as it's translated, befuddled, confused about what has happened. He says, how can the ark possibly come to me if this is what's going to happen? He realized that there was an offense caused, and so, as we said, he didn't want to risk any further displeasure from God, so he halted that progress. But he didn't stop there. Then he goes back, and we learn later on that he does his homework. He goes back and revisits what it was that actually went wrong. What was it that they had disobeyed? And in the second attempt, he follows the Mosaic law. He obeys the clear and strict instructions, and they handle it with more care. It's, you can't help but acknowledge in this that, that God does does. Uh, tolerate, if you will, God's anger. He doesn't immediately, swiftly punish him. But the difference there was, he wasn't treating God as though he was just in some box, that he was there to control him. We actually learn a little bit more of this story from 2 Samuel chapter 6. It says, when the ark finally arrived in Jerusalem, the correct way, Michal saw David's dance, and she despised her husband. Michal was David's first wife and the daughter of King Saul. Now we don't know exactly why she was contemptuous. Maybe it was from her father. In fact, note if you note in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, three times she's referred to not as the husband or as the wife of David, excuse me, but as the daughter of Saul implying that she wasn't behaving as David's wife, but more as the true daughter of Saul. She felt that her husband was getting carried away with her enthusiasm. He was acting undignified. But those who have no reason to dance before God, and those who have no reason to dance before God despise those that do. David removed his royal robes put on a priestly garment because he recognized the symbolic religious significance of the occasion. He was willing to look humble, common, and undignified in the eyes of some because he wanted to express his delight to the one that mattered, to God. Now as part of his celebration, David proclaimed a psalm of thanks it's recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And in this passage, he says, God is not to be feared, but he advises all of earth to tremble before him. Wise counsel, considering what happened to Uzzah. Uzzah and David both encountered the ark, one in death and one in dance. Uzzah was dead to the aliveness of God, while David was alive to God. God had, or David had learned how to live openly, trusting, passionately, and, exu and, ex and exultant before his Lord. He didn't seek to control God, rather he sought God's will. And it should be a comforting reassurance that while God, while God is holy... Because of Jesus, we are now able to come and welcome to come before him. Jesus was the only innocent man ever to be punished by God. But because of his sacrifice, he has shown us mercy and offered us forgiveness. Now, we may not like to think of ourselves as defiled, yet that is what we are. When he died... Jesus paid the supreme sacrifice for damaged merchandise. When he died, as we read in the New Testament, the, the curtain was torn back, ripped in two, symbolically showing that you, each one of you, have immediate access to the Father. 
Because Jesus is our high priest. But it's only when we begin to comprehend God's holiness that we truly understand the enormity of our sin and the price that he paid for our forgiveness. This week, not only this week, but going forward, let it make it our goal, our aim, that in everything that we do, in word and in deed, that we glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we acknowledge that there are pieces of Scripture that are, are difficult, Lord, to understand. And we also acknowledge that we, we will never on this side of eternity come to full understanding. Yet, Lord, we are thankful for the way that your word uh, complements itself in a way where we can look we can look through the lens of the stories from different perspectives, which is so true in life, that when we try to look at the things of this life through one lens, it can often be blurry and undistorted and difficult to distinguish. But if we look at it from another angle, things become more clear. Lord, we, we come before you acknowledging that, that all too often we, we don't regard the things that you have called to be sacred as sacred. We live this life casually in one moment reflecting on how holy and righteous you are and how you demand obedience but in the next living life as those were living in the days of Noah as though there wasn't a care in the world as though the things that you have promised us promised Noah and us that would come as though those things aren't real There are things all around us that seek to pull us from this path, to drag us into sin. Lord, we know that, that uh, Satan is constantly at work prowling around us, uh, using, using whatever tasks and people and, and influences he can to try to steer us away, Lord. But we also know that you are the God who has already defeated him, Lord, and that, he has, that, that Satan has no place in our lives, that you have uh, given us the opportunity to be free from Satan's power. Lord, give us that assurance that we have been saved into a kingdom of a God who loves us so much that he died for us to give us eternal life. In your name we pray. Amen.